a deconstructive reading of the Nigerian subaltern and Zainab Alkalis the stillborn. Assist. Professor Dr. Yakut Akbe. Abstract. Nowadays African women are taking an active role in the development of national literature both at home and abroad. However, the advent of female writers to literary arena was not a sudden event. After decolonization, African literary sphere was heavily male-dominated. Hence, the portrayal of the African woman was based upon the misrepresented image predetermined by the norms of patriarchal society. The emergence of women's writing in Africa was inescapable and necessary to resist and reconstruct meanings of womanhood created by male writers. The purpose of the present paper is to defamiliarize Spivak's subaltern as a female subject within the context of the Nigerian culture in Zainab Alkali's The Stillborn, 1984. It is argued that as opposed to Spivak's subaltern, the Nigerian subaltern can speak up for herself in the male-dominated society. African feminism is applied as a vernacular criticism to scrutinize meanings attributed to womanhood in the Nigerian culture. Derrida's deconstruction constitutes the theoretical framework of the study to reveal inconsistencies and controversies between the text and its signification. To this end, the research involves a number of terms and concepts devised by Derrida such as binary, logocentrism, difference and aporia. Keywords, African feminism, alkali, culture, difference, subaltern. Introduction African women play a significant role in the development of education and literature. Their initial art was verbal and didactic making a notable contribution to oral literature shaping African cultures and nations. These traditional values are instilled in young generations through prayers, lullabies, proverbs, riddles, and folk songs. The oral heritage transmitted by women also paved the way for the emergence of African fiction. However, because of social and economic reasons, women were not able to transfer this to the art of writing, which is why most of the literature produced after decolonization was heavily male-dominated. According to Busby, 1996, what is regarded as African literature, usually written in European languages, has a recent history dating from the 1950s with the publication of works such as Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, p. 13. Busby expresses her pessimistic approach concerning the absence of women from most early anthologies of African writing. She explains this situation on the grounds of gender roles ascribed to them by the male-dominated society. Busby states that while male writers initially focused on the theme of colonization by Western powers, women, in addition, had to struggle against colonization by their own men and the traditional norms by which formal education was reserved exclusively for men, p. 13. Indeed, most women writers believe that their voice in literature is subsumed under the repressive influence of their male counterparts, who have been brought up to take women for granted. Adiola James, 1997, argues that, our problem is that we have listened so rarely to women's voices, the noises of men having drowned us out in every sphere of life, including the arts. Yet women. Two are artists, and are endowed with a special sensitivity and compassion, necessary to creativity, p6. For this reason, women writers promote the idea of equality in literary sphere where male writers must change their prejudiced view on their disdainful and grudging acknowledgement of women's writing. It is noteworthy that the present-day African women's writing owes a great deal to the legacy of first-generation women writers. In this regard, Zainab Alkali is considered one of the pioneers of women's writing from Africa and the first woman writer from northern Nigeria. The Nigerian novelist Zainab Alkali received a doctorate degree in African literature, with SIT, 2012, p. 178. After 22 years of university work, she took a three-year break and worked for the National Primary Health Care Development Agency in Abuja, p. 178. In 2009, she was appointed as Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Nasarawa State University, where she teaches creative writing and African literature in English. In her novels, Alkali addresses the issues concerning the condition of women in patriarchal African cultures. The author usually sets her stories in rural areas of northern Nigeria to explore how communities come to terms with rapid social changes taking place in their daily lives. She also expresses a strong belief in the necessity of female education, which is accentuated in most of her novels and short stories. Alkali's debut novel The Stillborn, published by Longman in 1984, was hailed as the lone female voice from the north of Nigeria, Ugbabe, 1998, p. 15. In The Stillborn, Alkali is concerned with the life of the Hausa people constituting one of the largest ethnic groups in West Africa. Nigeria has a large and diverse population consisting of more than 200 different ethnicities, Falula and Mheden, 2008, p. 4. However, the main ethnic groups that make up the majority of the population are the Hausa, the Yoruba, and the Igbo people. The Hausa people live in the northern part of Nigeria and constitute roughly 21% of the population, whereas the Yoruba people, who live in the southwestern part of the country, make up 20%, and respectively, the Igbo people live in the southeast area accounting for nearly 17%, p4. These multiple ethnic groups shape the culture of Nigeria. Apart from diverse population, there are two major religions in Nigeria, Christianity and Islam, both of which are practiced by nearly half of the population of the country, Phillips, 2004, p57. 
Christianity prevails in the southern part of the country, while Islam in the north, p57. Some Yoruba and almost all the Hausa and Fulani people are Muslim, p57. Culturally, Nigerian people are influenced both by their local traditions and values and lifestyles adopted from the West, Falola and M. Heathen, 2008, p6. In addition to this, polygamy is still commonly practiced in the country, while monogamous marriage is prevalent among Christians and the educated elite, p6. Since both Indian and Nigerian societies are patriarchal in nature, this makes it possible to adopt Spivak's subaltern for the study of the Nigerian cultural context. In her essay Can the Subaltern Speak, Spivak views subaltern as a female subject. She argues that the question of woman seems more problematic because if you are poor, black and female, you get it in three ways, 1987, p 294. She develops a gendered analysis of the subaltern by examining the situation of Indian women and their representation in Western discourses. Spivak states that the subaltern is unable to raise her voice since there is no space from which the sexed subaltern subject can speak, p 307. Therefore, she is, miss, represented by the discourse of the male-dominated West and the male-dominated East. The author concludes her essay by reiterating her pessimistic standpoint that the subaltern cannot speak, p 308. The aim of the present research is to defamiliarize Spivak's pessimistic approach concerning the condition of the female subaltern in terms of the Nigerian woman, who, even living in a patriarchal society, carves out her own space from where she can speak up for herself. In this regard, the deconstructive reading of the text in the light of African feminism serves as backing to the above argument of the study. In The Stillborn, 1984, Alkali treats the themes of contemporary Nigeria from the authentic perspective of a woman raised in traditional norms and values of the male-dominated society. The novel is rich in dialogues, flashbacks and dreams exposing or foreshadowing particular events in the novel. The protagonist Lee, a 13-year-old girl, returns home after completing her primary education. Being restless and impulsive by nature, she finds the atmosphere in her father's compound suffocating, The Stillborn, 1984, p3. The household regards Lee's independent spirit as impatience and stubbornness, p4. She is expected to perform the usual household chores as every young girl does, sweeping the compound, fetching water from the stream and firewood from the neighboring area and washing dishes. However, she was dreaming of a paradise called the city. A place where she would have an easy life, free from slimy calabashes and evil-smelling goats. She looked down at her coarse hands and feet. One of these days she would be a different woman, with painted nails and silky shining hair, p55. Later, she meets Habu Adams, a young man from the village whom she plans to marry and settle in the city. They would live in a big European house full of servants. However, after they marry, when she is 15, Habu abandons her in the village. Four years pass. Finally, she goes to the city to find her husband. She discovers that he has failed to become a doctor and earns his living as a salesperson. Moreover, he has taken another wife. The city holds nothing for Lee except frustration and despair. The spontaneous and spirited girl becomes a grim and sober-minded woman. It destroys dreams, she says of the city, p94. One daily dreams that her father's home has burned down, she hurries back to the village and finds that he has died of an illness. She is pregnant and gives birth to a daughter, Shua. Eventually, she becomes the man of the house, p101, a position for which she has been psychologically preparing herself. Lee knows that she has to find her own happiness, and by the end of the novel, at 29, she completes her studies at the teacher's college and becomes a successful teacher. The role of education in the awakening of self-awareness of the main character is one of the recurrent themes in the novel. This is suggested from the very beginning of the novel when the protagonist Lee, being a 13-year-old girl, is returning to her village after finishing her primary education, which is considered the only education appropriate for girls in the Hausa community. In fact, the restricted access to education is one of the serious issues in Nigeria affecting women's position in society. This gender inequality stems from patriarchal cultural norms which relegate women primarily to the domestic sphere. In the house's system, girls are mainly involved in domestic labor as well as the care of younger siblings, whereas boys are spared for education in the hope of subsequent access to waged labor or higher education, Hidden, 2002, p 351. For girls, education is regarded as a temporary diversion before entering into marriage, childbearing, and home and farm-based subsistence production, p 351. Thus, girls are denied the right to proceed further, that is, to higher schooling. Alkali, as an advocate of social reform, underscores the importance of female education throughout the novel. She strongly believes in self-fulfillment of Nigerian women attained through education since literate women help to educate the children, which is aptly reflected in the Nigerian catchphrase educate women and you educate a nation. P340. The sad feelings of Lee's homecoming are accompanied by an elaborate description of the village. It is depicted as large and unequally cleft in two by a long narrow stream, almost hidden by its bushy banks, the stillborn, 1984, P2.
The smaller side of the village is less crowded thus appears to be quiet and deserted consisting of farmland and a few scattered mud huts, P2. However, on the opposite and larger side, flourished a long stretch of fruit trees, richly dressed in green, P2. Since the larger part of the village is more populated, it lay sprawled in clusters of thatched mud huts, P2. The use of such words as flourished and green stands for liveliness and development of the village. On the other hand, peace and quiet dominating the smaller part of the village, suggest the innocent and natural state of the idyllic rural life cherished by the villagers for centuries. However, the image of village ends with a range of hills, at the base of which there are the European quarters known as the Hill Station, P2. The houses in complete contrast to those in the village are built of stones and roofed with asbestos, P2. The gigantic view of modern houses evokes an uncanny feeling, which the author develops by providing a further description, built on a much higher plane and facing the rest of the village, they the houses had assumed the look of an overlord. This advantageous position was further heightened by a thick overgrowth of trees that shrouded the houses, giving them the desired privacy, P2. The description of the village reveals the binary opposition between modernization gradually permeating the rural life and tradition. It is implied that modernization is gaining ground by becoming an authority in the rural domain. Even the generator in the village lent its light only to the hill station and the memorial hospital and a visitor at night was apt to think that only these two places existed in the village, P2. The sound of the generator is contrasted with the rustic voices of the villagers. By going to sleep and getting up by The sound of the electricity generator, the villagers are slowly being adjusted to the way of life introduced by modernization. The process of usurpation taking place in the rural area may be regarded as a dangerous supplement to tradition since it is replacing the norms of the rural community whose rituals and traditions have been cherished for many centuries being handed down through many generations, of Grammatology, 1997, p. 149. Lee's father, Baba, is the patriarch of the family madly obsessed with discipline. His household principles make Lee feel trapped, suffocated, and unhappy, the stillborn 1984, p. 3. She abhors the don'ts that have heavily outnumbered the do's, P3. Her rebellious nature does not allow her to blindly accept and obey these rules. She considers them stupid and unnecessarily rigid, P3. The signifiers suffocating trapped, unhappy restrictions and prison connote patriarchal oppression consigning women to the subaltern position. With so many restrictions imposed by her father, Lee assumes that the only way to escape from this prison is to marry Habu and move to the city. Her daydreams of the city, which she calls paradise, start to take shape after she meets Habu, P55. They are also embellished by exaggerated images of a big European house full of house boys and maids, p. 55. Lee virtually loses touch with reality when she dreams of the luxuries the city could offer, p. 57. She is unaware that her feet barely touch the ground, p. 55. Being completely unfamiliar with urban life, Lee creates her own myth of the city full of wonderful and exciting things where young people are eager and ready to enjoy life to the fullest, p. 57. In fact, the young people who are tired of the norms and restrictions of their community regard the city as the place where they can live freely without any obligations. Besides, the city, standing for modern values, offers new opportunities for them. However, the villagers belonging to the older generation are opinionated about urban life and modern values. They believe that the dangerous supplement called modernization is encroaching on rural way of life gradually destroying its tradition, of grammatology, 1997, p. 149. In the Deridian sense, this way of life is a garment of perversion and debauchery and a dress of corruption, therefore, these elements of modernization become seductive leading desire away from the good path, pages 35151. Similarly, the main concern of the rural community is that modernization will eventually usurp traditional values entailing degeneration. However, they refuse to admit the fact that usurpation has already begun, p37. Apart from the dichotomous relationship between modernization and tradition, the stillborn addresses the condition of the Nigerian woman in terms of local customs and various aspects of womanhood, which makes it possible to examine the Nigerian subaltern within the vernacular female discourse known as African feminism, otherwise called African womanism. African feminists are different from their Western counterparts in that by using the term woman as a universal group, the former are only defined by their gender and not by social classes and ethnic identities, whereas Western feminists ignored the voices of non-white, non-Western women for many years, Bayou, 2019, p. 55. Moreover, third world feminism considers gender discrimination neither the sole nor perhaps the primary focus of the oppression of third world women, p. 55. According to Mary Kolawola, 1997, African womanism embodies a set of values that reconstructs a more accurate, a more valid and a more authentic wholesome African feminine consciousness and actions, p. 204. She expands this concept further, African womanism cannot be separated from humanism. Rather, it seeks to enrich the female gender through consciousness raising while giving a human touch to the struggle for the appreciation, emancipation, elevation and total self-fulfillment of the woman, in positive ways, p. 204.
African womanism is an accommodating and valid criticism to analyze such issues as bride price, polygamy, male child preference and infertility depicted in the stillborn. To begin with, the novel suggests that as a custom, bride price is still practiced in most rural parts of Nigeria. Bride price is part of tradition according to which a bridegroom is supposed to give a sum of money or other valuables to the family of the bride. However, most young bachelors in rural areas do not welcome this tradition because they find it difficult to accumulate enough savings to pay the bride price. Gabra, one of the male characters in The Stillborn, aptly remarks that getting married is not expensive in the city and that a man can live with a woman of her own free will without having to pay anything. The Stillborn, 1984, pages 445. Alluding to the issue of bride price, Bachi Emekata recounts her own situation when she was young and literally put up for sale. She states that she comes from a place where a woman is paid for, Emekata as cited in Gobo, 1988, p. 151. She resentfully remembers that while her family could not afford to pay for her education, which she accomplished with the help of scholarships, they readily bargained for her as people do in the bazaar when it came to the bride price, p. 151. Moreover, by proudly declaring that she has English education, they pushed up her bride price, p. 151. Due to these debasing aspects of local cultures by which women are treated as commodities, Emekata states that women are the money that are being sold and they have to abolish that before they start being independent, p. 151. Polygamy is another cultural practice prevalent in most parts of Nigeria. In most Nigerian communities, polygamy is regarded as a legal marital institution wherein a man marries more than one wife and provides for them equally. However, in the stillborn, some male characters deviate from its legal obligation and regard this status as a means to an end. For instance, Gabra, who is the only person having first-hand experience of city life, favors polygamy by stating that in the city a man can acquire many wives without slaving for them, rather, they all slave for him, the stillborn, 1984, p. 45. He furthers his account by adding that in the city you do not have to live together in the same house and that he has a friend who keeps four women in four different areas of the city but none of them knows the others exists and they all slave for him. P. 45. Ignoring the presence of the women, Gabra boasts about the opportunities that the city offers to men. However, his views as to both tradition and modernization are contradictory. On the one hand, he favors polygamy judging as a typical male representative brought up by the values of a traditional patriarchal society. On the other hand, by stating that in the city, a man can acquire many wives without slaving for them, he deviates from the liability of the traditional polygamous marriage, p. 45. Gabra attempts to adjust polygamy so as it suits his needs, which, in the Deridian sense, may be interpreted as a supplement to the existing system. In terms of supplementarity, Gabra's attitude may be described as a lopsided perception of both traditional and modern values, which he prefers to call the virtues of city life or, as he puts it, civilization. It is impossible to designate Gabra's assumed values as either traditional or modern since they exclusively serve his own interests. In terms of deconstruction, this logocentric approach also reveals the effect of patriarchy in the Nigerian culture by which the masculine is favored in the construction of meaning. Hence, by legitimizing binaries, the power of logocentrism enables the male perspective to perpetuate gender inequality in society. Florence Stratton, 1994, argues that before the advent of women's writing in African literature, polygamy was never dealt with by male authors and the exclusion of patriarchy as a determinate historical, social and political condition has a number of interrelated consequences for current theories of African literature, p. 171. In The Stillborn, this attitude is observed in the discussion of polygamy through the display of heterogeneous ideas expressed by both male and female characters. For instance, Awa, Hebu, and Dan Fiamma react to the city wisdom keenly propagated by Gabra producing various justifications. Awa condemns Gabra's account of married life in the city by calling it prostitution rather than marriage, the stillborn, 1984, p. 45, Dan Fiamma, on the other hand, does not approve of Gabra's approach to polygamy stating that in the traditional polygamous marriage each woman looks after herself and her children, while the man keeps a common barn, p. 45. Habu expresses his indignation by stating that it is impossible for a man to love all of his wives at the same time, p. 45. Although the young members of the rural society cannot come against their tradition, they may use it as a tool for disguise just like Dan Fiamma, who only appears to be a traditional family man. On the one hand, he does not consider himself a suitable candidate for polygamy and believes that polygamous marriage kills manhood, on the other hand, this perception does not prevent him from taking his pleasures elsewhere, p. 46. Awa is also disapproving of polygamous marriage. However, she does not endorse this practice simply because children of different mothers dislike and distrust each other and co-wives are constantly vying jealously for the husband's favor, which creates a tense atmosphere at home, p. 46. In this sense, her views are similar to Gabra's logocentric attitude since neither are concerned about how polygamous marriage affects a woman and her feelings. Another female character, Faku produces another perspective on polygamy. 
As a female, she is expected to disapprove of the practice of polygamy since it is degrading to women. On the contrary, she does not see anything wrong with that, particularly concerning Gabra's views. She resorts to polygamy as salvation to improve her living conditions and an ultimate solution to her predicament. She would like to be Gabra's only wife. What woman wouldn't? But if the man could afford to feed a dozen other wives, who was she to object? For her, polygamy wasn't the point at all. The point was that once she married, living alone with her mother was over. They would no longer have to work their fingers sore to feed themselves or mend the leaking roof, because someone else would be responsible. She did not seem to have taken in Gabra's jibe about women slaving for men. The Stillborn, 1984, p. 46, obviously, the young generation is torn between advantages and disadvantages of their culture. This impasse or contradiction suggested by the text on the discussion of polygamous marriage is associated with Derrida's aporia, by which the context neither produces nor guarantees impassable borders, aporias, 1993, p. 9, another issue in the stillborn that is worth considering is male child preference. Lee's father, Baba, favors his son over his daughters by ignoring his mistakes and directing all the criticisms, rebukes and punishments at his daughters. This unfair treatment stems from the same patriarchal norms enabling men to be held in high esteem as compared to women in the Nigerian society. According to Rajai, 2016, ideas about manhood are deeply embedded in Nigeria and that from an early age, male children may be socialized into gender roles aimed at keeping men in power and control, p. 59. Hence, the root causes of male child preference are the underlying patriarchal attitudes and behavior, as well as discriminatory gender norms and structures, p. 59. Similarly, in her internationally acclaimed essay Feminism with a Small F, Emekita states that in many parts of Africa only one's enemies will go out to pray for a pregnant woman to have a girl child, 1988, p. 179. Since most people prefer a man-child, the prayers go as follows, you will be safely delivered of a bouncing baby boy, a real man-child that we can and make jolly with whiskey and beer, p. 179. Moreover, the pregnant woman does not protest at these prayers because she also wants to have a man-child, who will not be married away but will stay in the family home and look after his mother when she becomes weak and old, p. 179. Based on her first-hand experience, Emekita argues that in most African societies the birth of a son enhances a woman's authority in the family, p. 179. On the other hand, a girl child is conditioned into thinking that being the girl, she must do all the housework, she must help her mother to cook, clean, fetch water and look after her younger brothers and sisters, p. 179. If she complains, she is sharply reminded by her mother that she is a girl who is going to be a woman, p. 179. In the stillborn, the predicament of the Nigerian female subaltern is made worse by such issues as fertility and impotence. It is pointed out that a woman is even more desperate in her society particularly if she is left on her own. In this regard, the inclusion of the minor character, Hajiya, the owner of the city house where Lee settles with her husband is not coincidental. In doing so, the author accentuates the importance of potency and fertility in the Nigerian patriarchal society. Hajiya marries at a very young age but since she cannot procreate, her husband remarries several women with whom he has many children. Hajiya experiences a deep emotional pain with every birth in the family and polygamy only adds to her state of childlessness. Hajiya finds herself in a situation when she is held responsible for infertility. Bereft of the role of motherhood and pushed to the background, she feels marginalized and estranged at her husband's home. She cannot find her place in the family thereby exercising her position from the periphery. As a result, she is reduced to a permanent state of subalternity. In this sense, Hajiya is the archetype of all the women who are burdened with fertility rights enforced by their patriarchal communities. She expresses her womanly feelings when she confesses to Lee that it is painful and hard when you have no man or child to hug, The Stillborn, 1984, p. 73. It is noteworthy that the novel also reveals how Nigerian men treat the issue of infertility. As a reaction to the male critical discourse that valorizes and idealizes womanhood and motherhood within the conventional framework, Alkali portrays a male character, Manu, who is a miserly bachelor and notorious woman hater, p. 53. He knows that he is unable to copulate but does not dare to reveal his vulnerable state, which explains his misogynistic attitude. Manu's impotence challenges the logocentric attitude of infertility traditionally ascribing childlessness to women. His impotence stands. For male powerlessness and incompetence. His situation is epitomized by a wise old saying that the chicken is better left in its feathers since that way you never know how thin it is, p. 54. The juxtaposition of Hajiya's plight and Manu's ironic situation demonstrates that the position of the Nigerian subaltern is predetermined by the strict norms of the male-dominated society. In this regard, Ngobo, 1988, explains that fertility is important to African families since a man sees it as a sacred duty towards his whole lineage, p. 142. Therefore, 
it is a taboo and a shame if a man fails to immortalize the ancestors, p. 142. As a result, childlessness is associated with women, and otherwise is unthinkable, p. 142. The subaltern position of the female characters Li, Awa, and Faku gains prominence in their conjugal relations with their partners Habu, Dan Fiamma and Gabra, respectively. Their aspirations are clearly manifested in the initial dreams. Faku is determined to marry Gabra and settle in the city. Thus, overwhelmed by the city fever, she cannot wait to leave the village. Also, the city is Faku's escape from the pressure of the suffocating conventions of her community. She even expressed great pity for the two sisters whom she believed would never be privileged to see the city lights, the stillborn, 1984, p. 56. Faku is not disturbed by Gabra's shadowy and insecure background. Moreover, she does not mind marrying a man who has another family in the city. The mindset imposed by the tradition of her community does not allow her to question her position and her ignorance only adds to this condition. On the other hand, Awa is not concerned with the city, which is aptly stated in her response to Faku that they need not go to the city. The city will come to them. The government will soon take over all schools and hospitals. That means rapid development, p. 56. However, the dreams of these women are shattered by their repressive and alcoholic husbands. Lee, on her part, still dreams about modern life in the city. The passage describing her anticipation after her husband's departure constitutes the breaking point of the protagonist. The suspense in her life discourages her from the goals that she has endeavored to achieve. Her mind went back over the last four years when her life and her hopes had been different from what they were now, p. 56. All the dreams about the qualified doctor, the great eye teacher, the big European house full of servants remained as dreams, though the future was in their hands, p. 57. The manner of anticipation is emphasized by the recurrent use of the signifier still that suggests various connotations, four years later, Lee, a young woman of 19, sat still on a mat, her legs crossed in a meditative position.